language, for instance, um, we, uh, we often need different data sets for different domains. So it's not just about testing out a particular method um, on one data set. And crowdsourcing is a uh, cheap and fast way to get data. So um, I don't know who has actually worked with crowdsource data before. Um, I'm assuming that some of you may have used it, even if you haven't collected the crowdsource data yourselves. And um, so I'm just going to try and bring, just get the right view on my screen here. <laughs> uh, it's very confusing when I can't see you. Um, right, so yes, yeah, so crowdsourcing is where we uh, ask um, people using a web uh, platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk, we can go and ask people um, to do annotation tasks for us. So we, are, we have some data set that we need to be labeled and we ask hundreds, possibly thousands of people uh, to provide annotations for a couple of cents per annotation. And um, that means that we get lots of non-expert annotators who can do this labeling task very, very quickly because there are so many of them waiting to, to do some work there. Um, <clears throat> And what you need to do to make that work is break up your annotation task into little steps that can be followed very easily for non-experts. So you can provide some simple instructions and people can just follow those. Um, but the problem is that the data you get back is of course kind of weak labels. What, what I mean by that is it contains um, a lot of errors, <coughs> look like errors. Um, so you've got different sources of disagreement between, between the annotators. Um, so firstly, you have um, genuine mistakes and errors in the data. So where people just label something incorrectly by accident. You've got people who are kind of spammers um, who try to get paid for doing this task um, by doing the minimum amount of work possible. So they're trying to click on uh, the annotation on the interface um, that you've provided and they're clicking the button as quickly as possible and they're giving you rubbish data. Okay, so um, those are two types of errors, but you've also got tasks that are ambiguous by nature. So not everyone agrees on what the correct annotation should actually be. Um, and that is, specific, is particularly important um, in a lot of um, text and language data. So this little diagram thingy on the right-hand side is trying to sh is showing you one example. Um, there's part of an argument, and you're asking your crowd workers how convincing that argument is. Um, and of course, that's not uh, a question that has a, a clear answer. Um, and related to that, in some ways, is subjectivity. So some people are just not going to agree with each other on what the right answer should be because they have different viewpoints. Um, so what we usually do is we want to get some kind of gold standard from um, the labels we collect from the crowd. So we ask multiple annotators to do each labeling task, to label each piece of data, uh, and then in some way we need to aggregate those labels to estimate the gold standard. Um, so the question then is how can we best deal with these different types of disagreement when aggregating these weak annotations from crowds. Um, so uh, one thing, yeah, so I'm going to talk about two aspects of this. So the first one is about preference learning, which is a way that we can try to deal with some of the ambiguous annotation tasks. And the second one is about how you actually aggregate crowdsource class labels. So if we get classifications from a crowd, how do we estimate what the correct um, classification is? Uh, okay, so let's begin with this. Um, so a bit of motivation. Um, so I, I briefly mentioned this um, task to do with arguments and their convincingness. Um, so you might be faced with a large text corpus like at this whole collection of uh, books in a library. So some historical archives. Uh, it could also be social media or something online. Uh, and you want to find the most persuasive arguments on a topic. Like you want to find out why people have argued to invest in nuclear energy. Um, so what we would like to do is extract some arguments from text and then learn to predict um, how convincing they are so that we can find the most convincing ones. Uh, and clearly this is an ambiguous task because there are not two clear 
categories here. Um, so there's no cutoff between convincing and not convincing. So how would we ask the annotators to provide this data? We, we could ask them to provide a numerical score. So like, um, well, look at the bottom of the slide. We've got um, one uh, snippet of an argument, and then we've got a dial that you can set. So the, the annotators have to choose between poor and good, uh, somewhere to set this dial for how, how convincing they think this uh, argument is. Um, and it's quite difficult to choose a specific value for that. So annotators, they're not very consistent over time. Um, different people are going to interpret the scores differently. So Bob might give a four star rating or somewhere at the high end, close to good. And Alice might then give five stars like right at the good end. And they might really mean the same thing. So it's a problem for aggregation. Uh, and if you've got a fixed number of categories instead of a dial, like you give people uh, movies to rate from one to five is quite a common thing, or Amazon ratings where you assign stars. Um, you've got a fixed number of categories, so you can't really sort all of these different um, uh, pieces of data. So you couldn't sort all the arguments um, and find out which is the best one. Uh, so we can get round that problem by using preference learning. So you can reformulate some of these ambiguous annotation tasks as uh, preference learning. Uh, and what we do there, and this is, I apologize for the slightly crowded slide. At the bottom, we've got two example arguments. This is on a topic about whether Firefox is better than IE. And um, you just ask the annotators to compare the two arguments and choose the, the one they think is more convincing. So they mark their preferred argument. So this removes a lot of the ambiguity in the labeling because um, it's a binary label now. There's no need to choose a specific number. Um, and that means that pe you can um, get people to label more quickly. It's easier to just pick one of two rather than uh, choosing the specific number. You don't need to calibrate those, those scores for different annotators. And uh, what I should have said first is you can get greater precision by sorting the whole data set if you need to. Um, so in practice, we don't really want to compare every single pair, but we could theoretically sort out arguments and find the best one. Right, so what would be a model for doing this? This is the next question really, is how can we learn something that predicts those degrees of convincingness from uh, pairwise labels? So we need a function that takes um, the features of the arguments. And if you would just imagine for a moment that it can be projected onto one dimension, the bottom and the x-axis, um, you could plot the arguments here, and then you have some kind of function which tells you how convincing they are. So this convincing this function that varies somewhere across, somehow across this feature space. Uh, and if um, the score of uh, argument one, so let's say f of argument one, is less than f of argument two, you're going to get a pairwise label that says um, that argument two is preferred. That's kind of intuitive. And then um, we have some challenges to deal with when we have a realistic um, situation. So we've got those annotation errors when we're using crowdsource data, um, disagreements between annotators. Um, we also want to be able to handle sparse data. So we don't want to have to compare every single pair of arguments to one another. And we have a limited amount of, uh, limited amount of money to acquire these labels through crowdsourcing. Um, so we're going to look at a Bayesian solution for this because this helps us to deal with things like this, the annotation errors and disagreements and the sparsity of data. Um, so the model we're using for this is Gaussian process preference learning, um, GPPL. So to start with, um, I'm, I'm sure that some people will know Gaussian processes and some people maybe do, don't know. Um, so a Gaussian process is a probability distribution over functions. Um, so in the diagram down here, this is showing you the same kind of thing as what the last slide showed. Um, we've got the x-axis, which is some feature representation, uh, and the y-axis is the, the utility. So in this case, the convincingness of the arguments. Uh, and you've got a point here, xb, which is one specific argument that fits into this place in the feature space. Um, and this darker line in the middle is showing you the mean 
of our current estimate of the function. So this is our, our prediction for the convincingness. But we've also got this band either side, which is the um, standard deviation in our uh, posterior prediction of the, of the convincingness. So besides having a prediction, we've got some kind of um, standard deviation, which tells us how confident we are in that prediction. So if you take the pointer for XB, you've got a, a Gaussian distribution with um, that uh, prediction F hat B and uh, some variance VB at that point. And so where that variance is large, it's, it's usually in places where we have sparse training data, um, like on the right hand side of the line. And perhaps we have some areas where we have lots of training data and that uh, variance has disappeared to almost nothing. Um, like between 20 and 30 along the x-axis. Um, so I'm going to show you in a minute how that is useful, but um, the first question would be how to learn that um, function from the pairwise labels. So we can do this using a method introduced by Chu and Garamani in 2005, which is the preference learning variant of GPs. Um, so what we're trying to do is infer the posterior distribution over the function given the pairwise preferences. And we introduced a couple of years ago a, more, a much more scalable version of the inference algorithm that could, could scale to much larger data sets for doing this. So but I'm just going to sort of talk through this diagram to show you what it's doing. So we had our, um, imagine that we had our prior estimate before we see a pairwise label. Uh, which is this orange line. And um, then we're going to observe the labels for arguments A and C. Um, so we've asked somebody in the crowd to compare those two arguments. And we get these points here. And you'll see that um, since A was preferred to C, it's more convincing. The um, function at that point, for, xa has actually increased and the function for xc has gone down. So that's basically what's happening. We're, we're kind of pulling this line um, and we're sort of pulling and pushing the points on this line um, every time we get a pairwise preference label. Uh, okay, so now we have um, a model that can um, learn from pr uh, pairwise preferences. We have a few experiments to show what it does. So sticking with argument convincingness, we, we took um, about a thousand arguments from some online debating platforms. And then we asked these um, crowd workers on Amazon Mechanical Turk. So you call them M Turkers, they're sometimes called. Um, and we asked them which of the two arguments is more convincing. And by doing this, we can collect around 17,000 pairs. And we ask uh, each, uh, we ask for five annotators to label each pair. And then there are 32 different topics within this data set. So each topic is about some controversial thing like um, uh, to do with recycling or abortion or any other, there's a whole range of things in there. Um, <clears throat> so um, we have for all of the topics, a lot of labels so we can estimate the gold standard. Um, and then what we can do is to train a model on 31 of those topics and test on one held out topic. Um, so we're training the GPPL model on the pairwise labels for 31 topics, but we only take one crowdsource label per pair. So we've got no, um, no redundancy in the actual uh, crowdsourcing part. Um, so we end up with a data set that contains a lot of noise and conflicting preferences. So we've got um, different members of the crowd who are ranking these arguments differently. Um, and then we have two tasks that we'd like to do. One is on, on this test topic, the 32nd topic, to predict um, the pairwise labels that, that people in the crowd would have given and to rank those arguments. <clears throat> uh, and we can use a, as a feature representation, a set of linguistic features and some mean word embeddings for the, uh, the words in each argument. So given that, um, what we do is uh, compare it against an SVM and a BILSTM approach. And we get some quite um, big improvements, particularly in the ranking uh, task. And one reason for that is that our GPPL approach was learning a single model directly from those pairwise labels. Um, with the other two methods, we had actually trained, uh, we had actually used the gold 
scores for convincingness to train a regression model <clears throat> to do the ranking. Uh, and it doesn't work as well because the scores are not very well calibrated between the different topics. So, so one thing we learned from this is that having a model that can do preference learning from the pairwise comparisons is really effective. Um, but secondly, we can start to exploit the uncertainty estimates that the, the Bayesian approach provides us. <clears throat> so, um, so if you remember from the plot of the GPPL, uh, of the, the Gaussian process itself, we had those um, standard deviation bars either side of the line. Um, and that gives us some estimate of the model's uncertainty. Uh, now we can use that for active learning, which is where we um, begin with a very small number of annotations and we want to collect annotations from the crowd sequentially uh, and do so in a way that means we collect informative annotations so that we only need to collect a much smaller data set to learn our model. <clears throat> so we're going to try and label the most informative documents and we ran a simulation to, to test this out. We started with only two pairs um, as our initial data set chosen at random. Uh, then we train the GPPL model or whichever model we're testing. We can evaluate its accuracy, which we do in order to show a plot in a minute. Uh, and then we use our uncertainty estimates to, uh, to get labels for two most uncertain document pairs. So we can do the active learning step here, step four. Um, and then we repeat the process. Uh, and yeah, the next slide shows some results for this. Um, so the, the top line is what happens with GPPL. And by using these um, better uh, estimates of uncertainty, it's able to learn more quickly at the start and, and kind of uh, keep learning more quickly. Whereas we see those other two methods, um, either, either doing performing more slowly, like the SVM, or um, in fact, the BioSTM does quite well at the start, but actually starts to go backwards because it's sampling um, it's it's chosen uh, the samples badly and after a while it will start to recover as well but um, that falls off the end of the graph um, but so if you've got good estimates of uncertainty which you'd get from this Bayesian approach you're more likely to learn faster um, and, and keep learning um, incrementally over the period of, of the active learning uh, so something else we can do in an active learning type setting is think about um, other types of annotators beyond the crowd as well. So another type of weak annotation we can get is from the end users themselves. Uh, this is kind of a showcase as well for the, the benefits of this um, GPPL method. Um, so if we think about some, some motivations why we might want to do that, well, most tasks um, in practice, especially NLP tasks, they're highly specific to given uh, topics or users. So for example, community question answering. So this is um, websites like Stack Exchange or Quora that you might have seen before. So the, the idea is that you can post a question about some very, very specialized topic um, and uh, you can try and find answers there that other people have already posted. And if you're, if you're not successful, you post a question and um, sort of specialists in that area can come and write their proposed answers for you. So the task here is to try and match um, questions to, to answers on those forums. Um, the second task that's related in the sense of being very specific to individual users is summarization. <clears throat> so if you take a whole set of documents and you want to produce a short summary of them, um, this normally involves looking at a very specific topic that uh, perhaps uh, some generic model would not have, would have seen, some generic training set wouldn't would contain examples of that uh, domain. And um, perhaps the user is also looking for very specific um, bits of information that need to be included. So a generic model could have um, issues in meeting the user's needs. And the users could, in the question answering case, underspecify what they want. So their question might, it is often missing some key bits of information. Um, and often in summarization, you need some domain knowledge. Well, in both cases, you need domain knowledge. So a generic model could, could fail. And um, the text ranking system that you use um, to solve this could benefit from some user feedback. 
Okay, so um, we can then propose something like that active learning setup we saw before, but now for an interactive uh, text ranking uh, scenario. So if we stick with summarization for a minute, on the, on the sort of top right of the diagram, we've got um, two summaries that are presented to the user and we ask them to, to choose the one they prefer. So we've got the pairwise labeling task here. Um, we collect some labels into a, a data set down here. Um, we can retrain our ranking model, so GPPL. And then we can use that to predict the utilities, so the, the scores for the summaries. Uh, if we can generate a whole bunch of candidates, uh, this means possible summaries that we could use for this set of documents. We can then um, score each of those and give them a utility score. Uh, then we can use some kind of acquisition function. So this is the active learning part to try and select uh, pairs of summaries to query the user about next. Um, the difference here from the active learning task we saw before though is that uh, the user is probably just looking to find the best summary that they can. So we're not really looking um, just to learn a model for um, ranking summaries. We're looking really to find the best summary. So this is a slightly different task and it's really an optimization task. Um, so the goal is to find the best candidate with as few user labels as possible. And we can use Bayesian optimization to do this. Um, and I, I'll explain why in this bit. Um, so we're looking for the candidate that has the maximum improvement over our current best answer. So imagine that we have um, a, a model so far uh, that we've, we've learned from all the data that we've collected so far. And that's this one on the left hand side. Uh, and our current estimate of the best summary is XB. So this is what we would show to the user as the final summary if we stopped collecting feedback right now. What we really want to do then is find out if there are any points along this um, line that um, would actually be a better summary to show to the user. So that's why we're looking for the one that would have the maximum improvements. Um, of course, we don't actually know what that improvement is, so we need to calculate the um, expected improvements. Okay, and this is something we can do given our GPPL model. Um, in fact, given the, the GP here. So what we want to do then is select a pair of items to, to query the user about that includes that current best, um, so XB, and the candidate that maximizes this expected improvement. And the expected improvement then is taking into account two things. It's, tr it's um, taking into account how close the other candidate is uh, in its current prediction to the best candidate. And it's also taking into account the uncertainty, so that variance in the function. So the reason for that is that if, um, if the candidate is more uncertain, there's a higher chance that we've actually underestimated its, um, its uh, utility. So let's go to the, the image on the bottom left. You've got um, XA, which is the one that we end up selecting. So this is a candidate that has almost as high uh, prediction as um, the current best, but it's got quite a high variance. Um, and if you compare that to XC, that one is perhaps just as high, but it's got a low variance. So we're not going to choose that one um, because there's a smaller chance of XC actually turning out to be better than our current estimates. And we're not going to choose XD, that has got a high variance, but it's got a low, um, a low mean here, a low expected value of utility. So what happens is that we query um, that pair, so A and B, and then we end up with a new label on the right hand side. Uh, and it happens in this case that the user preferred A to B, so it was a good choice to compare those two and the function has been distorted so that um, XA is now much higher and XB has been pushed down. So we found a new, a new best um, candidate and um, by doing this process multiple times, we, we're using this GP model to find, uh, hopefully eventually we, we reduce this variance across the whole function in the places where there are likely to be good candidates and find this best, um, best candidate. 
Okay, so if we apply that to, to summarization, uh, we have some summarization documents, data sets where we, we summarize multiple documents into a sing, single summary. And then we can take the um, uh, relevant score for the 100 top ranked um, summaries that we uh, generate. Um, and we'll see that our GPPL model, first of all, improves over some other, other methods. So the, the two lines, the brown and the pink line, so these two that are kind of flatter at the bottom here are using a, a, a linear model that doesn't do so well at um, mapping the features of the text to the uh, score of the summaries. And then all these lines above this are using the GPPL and also this one at the bottom. So this one at the bottom is not using active learning, it's just um, collecting data by asking the user to, to label random pairs. Um, if we use some kind of uncertainty sampling, which was what the previous active learning experiment did, we get in the best case, this green line. Um, so that was the most effective form of uncertainty sampling we could come up with. And um, this is learning then that function across the whole feature space. The, the best kind of um, Bayesian optimization, so this expected improvement technique is this top line, which is learning much more quickly to find good summaries. And we can summarize this a little bit, these results a bit more. Um, so on community question answering, we can evaluate the accuracy of the method at um, choosing the correct answer for a particular question from some stack exchange data. We collect only 10 labels from the user and we can do much better with expected improvements than we can with these other techniques. So actually, if you use uncertainty sampling, um, so the first one is a non-Bayesian version and the second one is, is using GPPL. Uh, they both of those actually do worse than if you'd have just not got any more interaction data in this case. So they, they've chosen labels that have actually made the ranking function worse. Um, and in the summarization case, we had 20 interactions and all of these methods are, are making some improvement over the, the case of no interactions. But by having uh, this uh, type of formulation using Bayesian optimization, we can, we can learn much more quickly to identify good summaries. Uh, so that's sort of plugging the idea of having uncertainty estimates and trying to show you why those are, are really useful. Um, in tasks like preference learning. So one thing we didn't really look at much was the fact that the um, individuals in the crowd could have different ideas about uh, what they prefer. So there's some subjectivity in the crowd. <clears throat> and we could say that there are biased individuals. So we should try and adapt GPPL to cope with that. So each user is providing a limited number of pairwise annotations which means it's quite hard to judge their individual preferences. But there's two things that we might want to do, which is we might want to predict individual preferences of people in a crowd. So perhaps not the annotators on Mechanical Turk, but there, there may be some other settings where we're collecting data and we need to know individuals' preferences. So user feedback may be more, more uh, useful for that application. Um, we would like to use the model of individual biases uh, to improve our estimate of the consensus. So the idea is that if we know who um, has particular preferences, we can adjust our, our estimate of the gold standard or the consensus. And we're going to do this by using a kind of collaborative filtering technique, which is to exploit similarity between users' preferences. And this helps us to address that sparsity problem, which is that we only have a few pairwise annotations from each user. Uh, okay, so this is uh, just how that kind of model looks. Um, I, I'm actually gonna start with the equation at the bottom. Uh, I hope that people don't mind equations in talks too much. Um, some people don't like it. So instead of having an F function that just gives you the utility of an X, um, which is an argument or some kind of item that we want to rank, it's also a function of the user in this case. So this is a personalized rating um, for item XA, so item A with features XA and uh, the user J with features UJ. Um, and then on the right-hand side, going right to the end, we've got the consensus rating, so T 
of XA um, is something that is common to all of the users. But then we've used a kind of matrix factorization technique that you see in recommender systems in the middle um, to um, represent the differences between the users in terms of latent factors. So each, um, each of these rep latent factors kind of represents a characteristic um, of the items and the users. So we can say that um, people with certain, certain values for, for a particular component um, have the pre certain preferences for items that have matching values um, in, in their latent factor rating. So each item has then C different latent factors um, and each user has the same. And we get give a score to each user based on these latent factors. So they can kind of, uh, these latent factors can kind of capture an interest shared by multiple users. Uh, so if, yeah, right, so I won't say too much on that. Um, and individuals' preferences then a weighted combination of latent factors. So this means that we've got latent factors that help us share information between users when we have little data between for them, um, but we can still dis distinguish between them. Um, and each of these is going to be modeled by uh, a GP. So we have GPPL used to learn um, the functions for all of these different parts of the model so that we don't lose any of the advantages we had before of the Bayesian approach. Um, and this does actually give us in our earlier ex early experiments um, some improvements uh, the table at the bottom is showing some small-ish improvements on that task with argument convincingness. Um, so we've got a model that can estimate both personalized and consensus ratings. The table is showing consensus ratings. Um, we've done some inference using stochastic variational inference, which is the scalable, um, scalable proximate inference method that we use. And yeah, these results show us that we can improve the predictions by accounting for individual preferences and their the individual la labeling errors. Um, but uh, this data set is probably not the best one to showcase this. So I think there's some more work to do uh, to show that because the arguments in this data set were not very, um, there wouldn't be so much difference of opinion on what's a good argument because it contains a lot of really obviously badly written arguments. Okay, so um, how long are we talking? Ah, okay, we're talking quite long. Tell me when I'm starting to run out of time if that happens. <laughs> so I just pause for breath. If anyone has um, any questions at this point, that, the thing that you got lost on could be a good moment for it. Um, otherwise, I'll carry on. And part two is about um, a different set of approaches. So these are aimed at class labels. So um, how we aggregate multiple classifications from the crowd. Uh, so I talked about um, using crowdsource data for preference learning and aggregating labels from multiple people, but I didn't really talk about why um, that's actually, why that actually works. So why do we get multiple labels for the same data point? Um, we can actually turn to um, ensemble methods to see a reason for, for why this works. So if we assume that our annotators make uncorrelated zero mean errors, so if essentially if they all make um, different errors in different data points, then you get the average squared error for an individual annotator would look like this. So we've got um, uh, Inside the expectation term, we've got a little epsilon, which is the error rate for annotator K um, for data point X. So that is squared, and then we have an expectation over X, that should be. Um, and then we've taken the average over all of the annotators. So we've got K different annotators. Um, if we take a simple combination of those annotators, and um, moving down to this equation, I hope you can see my mouse. It would probably help a lot if you can. Um, so we've got ecom, which is the error for the combination. And looking inside that, we've got an expectation. Um, and then inside the expectation is how we compute the error for that combination. So we've got one over K again. So it's an average of the um, 
the errors of the individuals. Um, we can rearrange that so we can move the, the, the one over k. Uh, the squared is in the wrong place. Uh, okay, so this, that might, I think I've drawn that slightly wrong. We can move that outside. Um, the second part's right. <laughs> I think there's an error in the first part. So we get one over k squared that comes outside and we move the expectation term inside because it's a sum. And what it results in is that the, the er error of the combination is one over k of the error of the individual, of the average individual. Um, so the point is that by combining these different annotators, if they're making errors at different times, those errors tend to cancel out. Um, and so the whole combination um, has a lower error rate. So this kind of applies to, to crowd workers and asking them to provide labels. So in theory, the more crowd workers, the better. But of course, that means um, assuming that those assumptions uh, stick. So really, they're probably not going to make completely uncorrelated errors. People will make the same mistakes as each other in most cases. And there might be some biases, so there might not be zero mean errors. Um, so anyway, if we hope that it's somewhere close to that, we might get some improvements through having multiple people label each data point. But we can do better than that um, because those annotators are not equal in practice. There are those biases and uh, correlated errors. So we, we mentioned spammers before. There are people who just guess at the correct answer, people who just have different abilities to one another and different levels of boredom and enthusiasm. So each annotator is going to have a different level of accuracy. Um, the plot on the right, without explaining the methods too much, is showing you what happens. If you don't care about the differences between the annotators and you combine them with a simple method like majority voting, you get the orange line. So the accuracy increases as you add more annotators. <clears throat> but if you actually model how, uh, if you model the differences between the annotators and the types of errors they make using the second method, IBCC, um, as you add more annotators, your accuracy improves much more rapidly. So we're trying to model two types of error here, I guess. Um, so noise or variance, which is the random errors that people make, or that seem random, at least from our point of view. Um, but there's also a kind of bias where people consistently choose certain incorrect labels. So this is like spammers who could always click on the same answer just to do the task more quickly. Uh, perhaps also people who just don't recognize one, one class. So if you've got a classification problem, um, it's possible to misclassify one class as another all the time, and that would result in this kind of bias error. Um, if we know about those, we can, we can infer the ground truth more effectively. Um, so this method that was on that plot is IBCC, independent Bayesian classifier combination. Um, it's a prob probabilistic generative model, and the, the basic model was introduced by David and Skeen a long time ago. Um, but we, more recently, we've been working with a Bayesian treatment of that. And so it works kind of like this. So you've got a true label, which is the thing that we really want to infer, the correct classification for a piece of data. Um, but we observe the noisy label C, so a whole set of noisy labels. And um, these come from K different annotators. We also have a likelihood, um, which is telling us the likelihood of the annotations, those noisy labels, given the true labels. And it's trying to capture those noise and bias kind of errors. So in this example down here, we have a binary classification problem. So if the true label is actually a zero, um, we have this plot on the left showing you that the annotator K is um, more likely to choose a zero but they often still get it wrong and choose a one. On the right-hand side, if the true label is a one, um, then they have a very high probability of choosing the correct label, one. And so there are very, uh, there's a very high um, <clears throat> rate of getting, of accuracy on this class and a very low rate on that class. So this model can capture those differences. So if a person says, that something is uh, zero, if this, this annotator says zero, well, then we know that it's 
almost certainly going to be class zero because they're very unlikely to say class zero if it's actually class one. However, if they say class one, then we know that there is some reasonable chance that it could be, um, they could have made a mistake. So we can take those differences into account. Um, we need to do some inference over those, um, to, to predict those true labels T. So predict whether the probability that the label T equals class J, given those crowdsource labels. And we need to, of course, infer those, um, those likelihood parameters, those pies. Uh, so if you use a maximum likelihood approach, it it's tends to overfit. And here it's a problem because um, we have a lot of annotators who do very few, uh, sorry, too quick, a, a very few um, tasks. So these plots on the right, two of many examples from lots of different papers uh, where people have shown that when you put the tasks out on a crowdsourcing platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk, you'll get a few people who do, well, lots of annotations. In some cases they get uh, into the thousands. And then there'll be lots of people who do only a handful of annotations. Um, and if you think about it, um, would you trust the person who did five questions and got them all right? So they've got 100% accuracy. Um, or would you put more trust in somebody who got 90% of the questions right out of the thousands? So we don't want to really um, overfit to small amounts of data for those individual workers. So we can use um, Bayesian inference to help us deal with that better. So it accounts for the uncertainty in the model parameters. So especially in this pi here. Um, and it gives us some confidence estimates with small and noisy data. We've seen that already for the preference learning case. Um, and here we've used variational Bayes, which is not uh, an exact Bayesian solution, but it's an approximation to it. Um, and it, it happens to work uh, a lot quicker in this setting and give reasonable reasonable approximation to the, the full Bayesian solution. Okay, so that's what we've done here. Um, now, um, for a lot of data, this is um, a bit limited because we um, have only thought so far about the classifications of sort of IID data. So not about um, a lot of problems in NLP, for example, where we have sequences of labels. Um, and for that, we can do a lot better with a different type of model. And so here's an example of what I mean. So uh, looking at the, yeah, the example sort of a bit in the bottom half of this slide, um, we've got a piece of text, the teacher's observations, as it was the same back then, I ruled out a trauma. And we're trying to um, label a span of text. So that is the part starting from as until then. And the way that we usually encode this is uh, BIO encodings. So we label the individual words with a class label. Um, so we've given all of the things that are not part of the span an O label, which means outside. Um, and then at the start of the span, we have a B label. And then for all of the following tokens, we have I for inside the span. So what we want to do is label those uh, individual words with class labels, but we want to take into account the fact that there are some rules about how these uh, BIO tokens must work. So we can't have an inside uh, directly after an outside label. We need to have a B first, uh, for example. Um, and there's also different things that might emerge. Yeti, from... Yeti. Who's that? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and so we, we have Bayesian sequence combination, which is an extension to that previous method, the IBCC, which is trying to model this using a hidden Markov model. So we have our true labels. Um, in this diagram here, we've got a sequence of true labels. And they are um, yeah, following this order here. And we have our observations, which are the crowdsource labels. Uh, we could also treat the tokens as observations, but I haven't drawn them on here. Um, but one problem with that um, is that the uh, annotations from the crowd workers also follow these kind of rules so that we also need to model the dependencies between them. 
Um, so we have now a new type of likelihood pi that depends on the annotator's previous label. So that because the annotators also have to follow the BIO rules um, and they, their labels won't be independent given the, the ground truth anymore. So anyway, we have a model now for sequences um, and it's helpful because it recognizes that some of these transitions are illegal in both the true labels and the annotators labels. We can also model things like um, annotators having a bias towards spans that are too short or too long. So um, if, for example, an annotator prefers, uh, yeah, writes uh, mark spans that are too long, then you're going to have a higher probability of them labeling an I for inside a span um, if the previous one was an I. And the downside is that we've got um, a larger number of parameters um, in the order of the number of classes cubed. So we've got more parameters to learn. So this was a question was whether we could learn this more complex model um, <clears throat> despite the extra number of parameters. So we took some data sets for C. Edwin, um, yeah. sorry, yes. Uh, well, if, if it's not a problem for you, you have more or less five minutes to finish your talk. That will be okay for you or Absolutely. you think you yeah. need more time? Yes. No, no, I'm nearly finished actually. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry for in the, the interruption in any case. Okay, Thank no you. problem. Um, so I'll just show you this, this little bit here. Yeah, sure, so sure. We have these um, three sequence labeling data sets. And what it's going to show you here is we, we, if we were to know somehow which was the best worker from all of the annotators in our crowd, we could pick out these different um, performance scores, which are F1 scores. Um, if we take the majority votes, in some cases, it's not quite as good. In other cases, um, it can do better than the best worker. Um, but if we model the individual annotators, um, we can always get an improvement. So our IBCC model does quite well compared to the majority vote. Um, if we then model those sequential dependencies using these HMM based methods, we get some further improvements again. So especially on this argumentation data set here. Uh, so yeah, all of these, these things do help us um, in getting much more accurate labels out of crowdsource data. So you probably, if you're crowdsourcing your data, should use one of these types of methods rather than trying to just ask, uh, trying to use majority voting basically. Um, and you should be able to save labeling costs by doing this because you don't need so many annotations. Uh, so there's one more point um, was that we can actually, um, so usually we, what we do is we take the crowd, we ask them to label some data then we put that data into the model like BSC or IBCC, and then we produce a gold standard for training some models. So in this case, for sequence tagging, we can integrate all of that process together. Um, so we can couple BSC with a sequence tagger to learn directly from the crowdsource labels um, so that we can uh, use that sequence tagger to help improve the aggregation step itself um, and also get that uh, raw data to help improve the sequence tagger. So disagreements information goes in to the sequence tagger. Um, so we, we can do this as um, a loop. So we're, we're putting all our crowdsource data initially through BSC. It produces some aggregated labels and those can be used then to train a neural sequence tagger, which we then treat like a, it's an additional annotator. And we just put its annotations into the big matrix of annotations from the crowd. So we can keep doing that. Um, and that gives us some small improvements. So this is something we would like to, to work on a bit more. So we get some improvements over having um, just BSC on its own, firstly, um, and we get some improvements over using the BSC uh, to produce a gold standard for training the LS uh, for the sequence tagger. And then using our integrated method with that loop, we do a bit better. So um, this is using a bio STM type methods and you could integrate any old method in here that captures your local information about your, your task. All right, so um, yes, yeah, so the uh, practical machine learning problems, they need us to acquire data from multiple annotators. So crowdsourcing is often the way we need to go. Um, so if you're going to do that, you need to think about designing annotation tasks that reduce ambiguity. Often preference learning is a good option and you can handle the errors and disagreement in the annotators using uh, Bayesian methods. And this means 
that you won't need so many redundant labels than if you were using majority votes. Um, so we're looking at some things in the future, which is integrating some of this, that last step about integrating sequence taggers, um, whether we can integrate the whole process into a deep learning framework. Um, and then the next point is that there is still uh, a lack of models for aggregating different kinds of data, like structured outputs, and even numerical data, uh, we have models that we can use, but they're not um, it's, it's, they're not so well tested and well proven to work. Okay, so um, the last thing was that, as I said, you should use these methods. Um, we do have software available. If I share the slides later, you'll be able to find um, these things. So if you have crowdsourced data you want to estimate gold standards from, there, there's some tools you can use here. Um, okay, so thanks for sticking with me. I'm sorry if it was a bit long. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much for your nice talk. I don't know if uh, anyone here has any kind of question, please write your name in the chat so we can keep some order in the, in, when asking some questions. Um, uh, Pablo? Yes. Can I? Tell me, Pablo, yeah, sure. Go ahead, Paco. Uh, thanks, Edwin. Congratulations by your talk. Uh, we have here an uh, RSR line. We are starting analyzing anomaly behavior in crowd. And it's quite different because we analyze if one people of, um, or some people have a quite a different behavior than the, the majority, the population. Do you think in the future may be possible to use together the, your kind of approach to analyze crowd together to the the analysis of, of the, the anomaly in a big crowd? Um, so if I can understand, um, so, so you mean to analyze um, where uh, the kind of disagreements between people in the crowd? Yes. Uh, disagree with behavior probably, uh, because we analyze, uh, in this case, we analyze if one, now if, um, Yes, in any way, we, we, we analyze the anomaly, the anomaly in the crown, any kind of anomaly in the crown. Okay. Um, yeah, so you, you can find out, so we have those, those uh, parameters that represent the annotator's likelihoods of giving certain labels. Uh, and those kind of represent the behavior of individuals in the crowd. So you can find out if there are some people who confuse particular class labels, for example. Um, so that if, if that's a consistent pattern and lots of people have that, um, then that would be some, you know, some useful error analysis to do. So I think you can use the model that, it's that, that these approaches like IBCC or BSC have learned um, to analyze the crowd's behavior. Um, one thing we've done before as well is to cluster those um, annotators um, and you can find that there's often a, a few small groups of um, behavioral patterns. So people tend to do this, they fall into certain categories, like there are people who are kind of spammers um, that you can identify through these methods quite easily. Then there's other people who are very accurate and you can pick those out. So probably if there are certain anomalies that come up a lot, you'd be able to find them. Okay, thanks. Okay, so we have a question in the chat. Uh, well, if you want, if you want, Eric, you can ask yourself your question. No problem. I don't know if Eric is online. I'll, I'll re read it through. When you were yeah, well, talking exactly. about the number of annotators, crowd workers that we need for a good gold standard, is there any metric or method to find the kind of speed spot? Where more annotators do not increase the quality of the gold standards, but decrease it. Um, so I don't think that adding more annotators would usually decrease the quality, um, uh, unless there was something different about the new annotators you're adding, that if they were uh, known to be less accurate, that would be the only case. But usually if you're adding the same kind of annotators, it should, uh, yeah, it should increase the quality. In the worst case, it will be roughly the same. Um, there isn't really a sweet spot. This is, yeah, this is difficult. So you can make these plots like 
I think I'm still showing the screen, hopefully still working. Um, the plot that I showed at the beginning as a motivation, uh, like this one here, where you're adding annotators and you plot the accuracy. If you had some small uh, evaluation set, you could do that um, and see if your curve has, has flattened out. So if, uh, if this line starts to reach a, a flat point, then adding more annotators wouldn't be very useful. So that's probably what I would do to find out if, it's, if you've got enough annotators or not. <clears throat> Hopefully that made sense. <laughs> okay. Um, any more, any other questions? Hey, can you hear me now, please? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, because I, I was uh, muted and I was speaking ah. alone. Ah, okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, the, the thing the, that I were asking is that um, if is there any kind of point of number of annotators where the curve just flattened and we don't need to pay for more annotations because we already have uh, the best uh, possible gold standard? Yeah, I mean, th that point does exist. So like this, oh, this plot's only simulated data. Can, if you can still see the plot, I think. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, so I mean, this one's a simulation, but it, it's basically what we see on real data. <laughs> um, so uh, the number will vary depending on the amount of noise in the annotations and so on. Um, but yeah, up here, it's starting to flatten out. So probably it would be pretty much flat by eight or nine annotators. Um, so I guess you need to set some kind of top level of, of um, error that is tolerable, and that will be your limit for how many annotators you take. If you have like this small test set that you can evaluate um, the annotations you've collected so far on, then you'd, uh, you'd be able to decide if you've reached that, um, if it's reached convergence or not. All right. But yes, you should, you should get a point where it reaches the close to the peak. OK, thank you. OK, more questions? Yeah, so th these other methods are, are sort of helping you get to that peak quicker, I, I guess. So like on this line, we have four annotators with IBCC, and that has a similar accuracy to seven annotators with majority vote. So that I yeah, but uh, because the, the x values are so low, uh, I was thinking about maybe a thousand annotators or... This is meant to be a um, number of annotators per uh, data point. So in yeah, the real crowdsourcing setup, you'll have like thousands perhaps, or maybe it depends. It, you, could you could have a thousands or, or so on your whole data set, but for each individual data point, you usually have, yeah, somewhere in the range of three to 10 is normal for a classification task. Okay. okay. So not everybody annotates every single data point. Any other question? Well, in any case, Edwin, I would like to ask you um, if you think or were well, there are any particularities about the annotation of images or how to adapt the act, this active, flame, active learning framework to the annotation of images? I'd like to ask you that. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, most of these things can be applied directly um, to that. They're fairly agnostic to the types of data. So we had, uh, so all these, uh, I'm trying to find out what I'm looking for. <laughs> so the, these kind of plots of the GP, um, this is just a sketch. And um, although I was talking about text and arguments. This could be images and you could have the, the feature representation, uh, an embedding of an image um, instead of this x-axis here. So yes, it could, the preference learning can be a, a used to say refine some generated images or um, yeah, I, I guess different types of analysis you could do like looking for um, maybe you, you have some task which is comparing photographs or comparing landscapes or designs of a building and you want to choose the, the preferred one. Um, you can show images and people can compare them. And this model would take uh, uh, the image embeddings as its inputs. Um, this 
other stuff on aggregating class labels. So the IBCC model um, does not care about the data at all. Uh, then we have this BSC model for sequence labeling, which could relate to things like video frames. So maybe you're classifying the scene in, in a particular part of a video. Um, and in that case, I would suggest using this last approach on, uh, uh, yeah, this one, integrating a, um, a sequence tagger, which was designed for images. So this bit, the bottom left. Um, so again, you can integrate any, any model really here. <clears throat> so it happens that we've tested this out on uh, a lot of text tasks, but actually it could equally apply to images. Okay, well, perfect for my side. I don't know if there are more questions in the room. In any case, I wanted to tell you that uh, Eugenio was having some problems with his computer, so he oh, wants right. to apologize because he, he couldn't manage this last part of your talk, right? Okay, no problem. This presentation. Eugenio started to save the, the session, but he sent me an, I think he, he's listening listen to us, but he sent me a WhatsApp that now it's impossible for him to activate exactly. the microphone. Okay. And uh, he, he cannot start to reinstall uh, the session because probably because he's the, the coordinator of the session, we can lose it. Then Eugenio cannot uh, see you, Sank, oh, but me. thank you very much. And uh, she will contact with you, Sank. It was a pleasure to, to listen to you. Really, thanks by your excellent talk. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, we hope to come to be with you in the in the future to and also to maintain potential collaboration with uh, one Institute. Yeah, and um, that would be great. And if anyone um, is interested in, uh, well, anyone has any crowdsourcing they need to do and needs some help on using these kind of methods, then then let me know. <clears throat> or any other kind of collaboration ideas. Um, I guess I can share the slide. Can I, should I share the slides on here or should I? Well, you can send it to us because we can uh, share it in a, well, in a collaborative folder we have. No okay. problem. Thank you. Yeah, you can send it to Eugenio and myself. Yes. Okay. Cool. Eugenio, Eugenio told me, sent me an, a message now that he's uh, listening to us. He's listening to you, but he cannot uh, connect. Okay. Okay. Eugenio will write uh, you right there. <laughs> Sorry. Well, okay. uh, yes, uh, Eugenio and Pablo will share the, the slides with the okay. people attending to the, to the seminar. All right. Great. Okay, so thank you very much. And I think, Paco, we can finish here the talk. This yes, seminar. yes, yes. Thank to all the participants, um, really. And it was a pleasure to, to, listen, to attend with your uh, nice presentation, Edwin. And I hope to meet with, with you in the future and also with all the participants in the next seminar. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks for having me and thanks for listening, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.